Some of the doors to the church on the lower level were boarded up just for security and nailed shut. A dying Chicago parish on the verge of shutting down. It was like a ghost town here. Miraculously comes back to life. So we went from being condemned to excellent. And spawns a new religious order of priests. Imitate what you celebrate. Dedicated to replicating this miracle wherever they go. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The incredible story of the revitalization of St. John Cantus Church. Next on Assignment. Our goal in this parish is to make saints of everyone who come to this place. Real simple. It's just very, very simple. We keep the church open all day now. We open the church at 5.30 in the morning. It stays open till 7 o'clock at night. Unheard of in the city. But it seems to me that over these many years, what the devil has wanted to happen is to keep our churches closed that no one can make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. So by keeping our church open, anyone can come in throughout the day and make a visit. Sometimes in my homilies I tell the people the church is like a, a, a just a treasure chest. There's there's so much for each one of us. And so sometimes you know people just take one little piece of the treasure and just run away with us. Just, you know, just grab as much as you want. Keep coming back for more. And that's the spiritual life. Well, our prisoners are very educated, not educated, uh, white, black, Hispanic young, old, very involved in the church, just on the outside of the church. They're all coming here because each one of them is being nourished spiritually. The greatest teacher we have is Jesus Christ. And where does Jesus Christ teach us the best? At the Mass. So all these individuals are trying to truly live very holy lives in a very secular world. All right. Ready. Avanti. Avanti. Where do they get the nourishment? From the Holy Eucharist, from the Mass. People who built St. John Cantus Parish, as I understand, were from an area in Poland called Galicia. 
St. John Cantius was known as Polish Patch. It was a very tight neighborhood. Father Frank Phillips has been pastor at St. John Cantius Church in Chicago since 1988, and he's the first to admit that the patron saint of his parish is relatively unknown. Yes, no one has heard of St. John Cantius. St. John Cantius was probably the most obscure saint in the Roman calendar, medieval saint, patron of Poland, diocesan priest, educator at the Agellian University in Krakow, patron of educators. So St. John Cantius, because again, the foundation of this parish was Polish, it was naturally a, like a, a hand in a glove. Well, they should have some church dedicated to St. John Cantius. From the time it was built in 1893, the parish grew and flourished. By the early 1920s, there were over 23,000 parishioners. And, uh, well, even like when the grammar school was built, I understand at one time there were like 3,000 children in the grammar school. That was early 1900s, 1920s. The parish continued to thrive well into the mid-1920s. And then this parish had its first urban renewal with the uh, construction of Ogden Avenue. The school went from 3,000 down to 400. So that's how many parishioners were taken out just with Ogden Avenue going through. But the parish itself in the 40s, 50s, began just declining with decreased enrollment. And then in the late 60s when the Kennedy went through in 94, uh, they lost another 800 families. I think this was one of the first Catholic schools in the Archdiocese to close, I think, around 1968. So when the school closed, more people moved out. The church itself always was maintained very nicely. So it was always clean. But then we started going into like the uh, boiler room, uh, different storerooms. Every room was just filled with debris. Every window in the basement of the church was boarded up. Some of the doors to the church on the lower level were boarded up just for security and nailed shut. I remember talking to one of our brothers who was stationed here at one time. He and one of the other priests used to look out the window uh, in the evenings, and uh, it was like a ghost town here. And they always wondered, what will happen to Kantovo, which is the Polish for Kantius? What will happen to our Kantius? So many people said that the uh, expressways would kill all these parishes. And yet I always thought, well, if they take people away, they could also bring people here just as easily. And uh, that was one of the uh, premises I worked on when I asked to come here. Storytel is a nonprofit media foundation. We tell true stories, like the one you're watching now, that show extraordinary things happen when ordinary people answer God's call to restore the sacred. Creation of our films would simply not be possible without the help of many friends like you who share our vision of bringing souls closer to God through quality productions and widespread distribution. So please pray for our mission, and if you can, make a financial donation today. Thank you. So I had approached the provincial, saying that, you know, I'd like to be the associate here at St. John Catches. And um, as I was going into the provincial's office, the former pastor who was here like for 30 years, Father Felix is now deceased, uh, was going out of the provincial's office as, as trying to submit his resignation. So then the provincial asked, well, how would you like to be pastor? I didn't have a clue. You know, what, what that entailed, but... Uh... What that entailed was much more than Father Phillips could ever have imagined. He had taken on the difficult task of pastoring a struggling, large, beautiful old church, but he quickly found he'd also taken ownership of a Pandora's box full of extensive building maintenance issues. Because we had deferred maintenance here for maybe 40, 50, 60 years, many things were in bad shape. Mechanically, the parish probably would have closed by itself. Like our first heating bill, because 
13 radiators in the church were missing. When something broke, they just took it out and they never replaced it. So the boilers were going constantly. Our first heating bill was like $45,000. And our average collection on a good Sunday at that time was like $500. This must have terrified you. You know, I rightly don't think I was terrified because I think I was probably just too stupid to realize what a mess I got into. The shock of that first winter's heating bill prompted Father Phillips, with the help of volunteers, to begin work on the boiler. The boiler room was the, the heart of the parish at this time. After lighting, painting, and labeling everything clearly in the boiler room, they replaced the valves, radiators, and eventually the old boiler itself. But I didn't have a clue of you know, the whole physical structure of the buildings. I mean, uh, I'm glad I didn't. I think I would have had to have my head examined you know, to continue on this. Old wiring had to be ripped out and years of hidden debris removed. In the midst of all this, it was discovered that the approximately four-story high altar was not secured and had been held in place for years only by gravity and grace. A slight earth tremor could have caused it to fall forward at any time. We went from basically one crisis to the next. And one by one I was able to, with, well, always with the generosity of the parishioners, uh, tackle one project at a time. The bell tower, again, uh, is one of these, uh, like Pandora's boxes. Our bells did not work. So at that time, across the street, we had the National Security Bank. So they came over one day and asked, you know, if you know, what could we do to help? So I called the company and they said, oh, we, we could do, install this for $25,000. $25,000. So they gave me a check for $25,000. I got the check on the Feast of the Annunciation. When we were doing the bell tower, this one fellow said to me, he said, you know, he said, you have pigeon coops above the nave of the church. I said, no. What they, I guess, used to do is during the Depression, so they'd have meat, they raised pigeons, so they had squab. But the pigeons left 10 tons of their droppings in our church attic, which we then had to clean out. Probably our ceiling would have collapsed if we had not done something right away. At about the same time, they noticed something peculiar about one of the large circular stained glass windows in the church. So the, the stained glass window on the north side of the church was bowed out about 12 inches. So the stained glass people said, well, we better put a brace on this, on the window. Shortly after the brace was put on the stained glass window, the company hired to remove the 10 tons of pigeon droppings accomplished their job. When all that excess weight was finally removed, the window popped back. 12 inches. Now, if we had not had the brace, that window would have just collapsed. Saved from the brink so many times, they were finally feeling as if they were at least gaining on, if not getting ahead of the curve, when Mother Nature made a surprise attack on the old vinyl church floor. You remember a few years back, we had the, that horrendous summer where so many people died because of the heat? Well, our church was so hot, the candles on the altar liquefied and the floor buckled. So we had to remove the whole floor. And in keeping with his philosophy of repairing things so they will never have to be repaired again, Father Phillips set out with the help of artist Jed Gibbons, a parishioner, to design and install an all-wood floor that would not only last forever, but instruct you even as you walked on it. We put in the, the new floor with the intention that it would be a, a teaching device about the Christology, so the lifeline of Jesus Christ goes from the birth, the epiphany, the manifestations, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and so on. St. John Cantius obviously was watching over everything because sometimes I wonder how, how we did make ends meet, but we did every time. One of the things when I first came here was I told Provincial and the Council that I will do the, uh, the present Mass of Paul VI, which follows the 1972 books, uh, in Latin. Now what that means, okay, we'll do the Latin chant, we'll do Latin polyphonic music, we'll uh, do the, uh, the prayers, the canon, 
and so on in Latin, with the readings and the prayer of the faithful and so on in the vernacular. We don't know where they put him. And that's what actually when people started coming, you know, to the parish, just again, word of mouth. Usually when the choir sang in the service, we used to have more people in the choir and in the, on the altar serving than we had in the congregation still. But now the balance is uh, totally upset and there's you know, more people in the benches now. With the church building slowly but steadily being restored and the parish growing every month, Father Phillips then began looking into restoring the sacred heritage of the Catholic Church, such as the liturgy, the music, the artwork, and so on. When I got the idea to restore the sacred, very simply what that means is because we do the traditional Mass here, which is called the Tridentine Mass, and also the present Mass, keep the both books separate, do it each one. So in other words, don't confuse them and don't try to add, and don't try to subtract. we we'll do exactly what all the norms would require and just by doing that uh, is just a, a, just a tremendous thing in restoring the sacred because today there are so many adaptations that one wonders sometimes, because I hear this from parishioners, well, did I attend Mass or did I attend the Johnny Carson show? So as long as we can follow what is in the books, I believe we're doing a great service to the church. Time and time again, the young people are here because they've seen the traditional mass or the way the new mass is celebrated. They not have been exposed to it before, wherever they might have come from. They're attracted to it. And some people with all their kids, five, six kids in a van, may travel for two hours, come here for mass. People that were only going to the old mass come to the new mass. People only going to the new mass coming to the old mass. So that mixture of uh, being open to, uh, to the full treasure of the church. And the church is, you know, a little over 2,000 years old. So, I mean, the church is built on things that are old and ancient and, uh, and new as well. And it's, you know, good to have that combination effect. And that's what I see St. John Cantius doing. You have the new and the old, and you're bringing out the best of both. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our Restoration means being able to provide sacramental uh, services for the faithful, being faithful to the books which we use. Rubrics are very important because the more one is able to follow the rubrics, first of all, it shows a humility. And then the more one is humble at the altar, actually, the more Jesus Christ shows through at the altar because it's not me, it's Jesus Christ. I get letters, thanks for, thanks for doing the masses here, thanks for hearing confessions. You know, it's nice to have a place where we can go where we know there's confessions. They don't have to knock on the door, confessions, you know, from uh, 4.45 until 4.50 or by appointment only. I don't know how this happens, but it's so strange. There'll be no one in church. Someone will say, oh, Father, could you hear my confession? The green light goes on. One person in church. All of a sudden, there's like 15 confessions. I don't know where these people came from. Monsignor Schuler said this to me. His father was a shoemaker. He says, as long as the door was open and the sign was out, he had business. So the same thing for us. We usually average about maybe 350, maybe 400 confessions a Sunday. What do you attribute that to? We have, well, we, we have good confessors here. <laughs> That's one thing that is, is wonderful here is to have the reverence of the priests and the reverence of the, the people too. The parishioners are very reverent and uh, you can see that. The building uh, encourages that.
because this is the house of God, it's not man's house. We should not build this to suit our needs or to suit a fashion or a trend of the time. I mean, it's got to be built for God. We learn by our senses. So when someone walks into our church, well, it smells like incense. It, smell, it smells like a church, like people say. Well, there's their sense of smell. You know, they touch the holy water. There's a sense of touch. They see the church. They see all the art. Uh, well, there's another sense. A lot of people they don't realize the importance of art as, first of all, catechetical tools. Um, children grow up seeing all these little symbols on the walls in their church or little statues, and they become catechized about their faith. When you come in here, it's got to be so different from what you're used to that it's got to it's got to give you that sense of transcendence to make you think about heaven because the church is like a model of heaven and the sanctuary is uh, the holy of holies so that even more so than the rest of the church has to be a very special beautiful place music is important because uh, in elevating the not only the mind of uh, man but also the spirit because through the through the texts, through the tonalities, through the emotion of the music, uh, it touches you know, the, the very, very fibers of people's being. They hear uh, music, let's say, from Mozart or Gregorian chant. And what we're trying to do more than anything else is to implement the directives of the Second Vatican Council. I had said that our Catholic heritage of sacred music uh, is to be used in the fullest way possible. It is, it's, it's a treasure of, of uh, inestimable value. It's not about um, being a traditionalist or, you know, cutting edge, you know, it's, it's just about what is objectively beautiful, and um, let's go with that. Over the years, as Father Phillips and his team were restoring the building, bringing the parish back to life, and restoring the sacred heritage, many of the volunteers began coming forward, interested in becoming priests themselves. Storytell films are made possible by viewers like you who share our vision of bringing souls closer to God through quality filmmaking and widespread distribution. So, if you can, please make a financial donation today. Thank you. Father Phillips was out visiting uh, the school and something struck me inside um, during his visit that um, I may actually be called to a religious life. And the first Sunday that I uh, visited, uh, Father asked me if I wanted to serve Mass. So at that point I started serving and doing volunteer work and it got to be more and more. And I, I just knew that I wasn't, it wasn't just called to religious life, I was called to here. And when I came for my visit, that's what happened to me. It just felt like, you know, I could fit in here. So I went and approached Father and asked him if I could join the community. Either I called Cardinal George, he called me, he was already here in Chicago. There are ten men in this parish that are seeking the priesthood, or at least they have one way or another think they have a vocation of the priesthood. Ten men, he could not hardly believe what he was hearing. So he wanted to meet these ten men. So he came into the dining room, it was filled. There were about 30 men in there who in one way or another in the parish had thought about the priesthood. So with the permission of our provincial and council, with the permission of Cardinal George, I was able to undertake forming a new community of men dedicated to the restoration of the sacred, but more specifically, liturgical apostolate. To go out, you know, throughout hopefully the country and hopefully the world one day, to let people know that, you know, you can have 
still the Tridentine Mass, but you can also have the, a beautiful Novus Ordo Mass. And to show people that Mass is, you know, essential to our life, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And it has to be done reverently, respectfully, and beautifully. This is an ideal order because it's a place to restore a whole entire tradition of beauty in music and art that the Catholic Church has had. It's showing people that the beautiful things of the church in the past, and so many people are hungry for that, young people as well as the older people that remember when they used to have that. I think the original intention, it seems like with the apostles, he wanted them to be priests, but also still help, still have that brotherhood, that community aspect. We're all here to work together. We're all here for the same purpose. We're all here to support each other. To live together, you know, to pray together, and to help each other with difficulties or you know, trials they're going through, and also to share in their happiness and their joys. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The community is part of the apostolate. So we do get together for prayers, for recreation, for work, uh, for study, and so on. I come from a kind of a large family, so to me it's kind of a carryover from growing up. I have two brothers and two sisters. So it's like you know, having a lot of brothers, no sisters, a lot of brothers. Here are the beginnings of a society founded to make available to the people of God the heritage and gifts of the Universal Church in all their forms and all their splendor. It takes a lot of work to do what we're doing. But the thing is, this can be done anywhere. It would just take the time to look for, well, who can do this, who can do that, and so on. So it's not isolated, that's what I'm saying. And any parish can do what we're doing here. So all these individuals are trying to truly live very holy lives in a very secular world. Where did they get the nourishment? From the Holy Eucharist, from the Mass. A large old Catholic church, once slated for the wrecking ball, with less than 200 parishioners, now referred to as a treasure of Chicago, with over 3,000 parishioners and growing, and a new religious order doing the same. This is a story with no end in sight, a true story that shows what can happen when just a few of God's people decide to begin restoring the sacred. Yeah.